So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for asking me to contribute to this. I think it's a fantastic uh, forum. And it's clearly been generated by the fact that whilst those guidelines that we've heard a lot about this morning mention with 1C justification the uh, use of a heart team, up until recently, there's no, not been any consideration about what that team should comprise, how it should work, and the various practical issues that uh, need to be teased out. And I think it's great that uh, this society and our own are, are um, delving into that, because I think it's an enormous piece of work and very important. Just to digress slightly, during a previous talk, having had coffee at the interval, I uh, needed to take a comfort break. <laughs> Did you have any help? Okay. <laughs> and I, as, I, as I went in there, I had in mind that film that our <laughs> colonial uh, colleague uh, showed, which I think is fantastic. But I would just uh, suggest to the males amongst you that when you pop into the toilet and use the facilities, you will see a plastic sheet in the bottom of the <laughs> bowl. I don't know if you've seen this. Yeah. Uh, the idea being that you, uh, how shall I put this, uh, direct your attention to that <laughs> to avoid um, extraneous... Uh, Splashing, and the name of this sheet, has anyone seen it? <laughs> yes. It's called P-Wave. <laughs> and I don't know if that's just something that this, co this society has, has put, but it's called P-Wave, so I thought that's quite um, interesting. Okay. Uh, unlike the previous speaker, with, uh, for whom I have enormous respect, I thought I'd be uh, traditional and stick to the title of the talk. <laughs> and um, with that in mind, of course, I assumed that because David had a previous title, uh, that had a title but a view through surgeon's eyes, it struck me that the talk should be identical. In other words, what we present to the patient in the position of equi equipoise should be the same. Um, so that will be sort of largely my message, I suppose. That's on the Old Bailey, by the way, not the <laughs> top of our hospital. <laughs> So let's define our terms. A few years ago, in order to help my interventional colleagues, I put together what I thought might be a useful glossary of interventional terms, a bit like <laughs> the dictionary of the English language that uh, Dr. Johnson produced in uh, about uh, 300 years ago. And so I thought I'd define equipoise as follows. In other words, a position where evidence for one approach is exactly counterbalanced by data supporting the other. And then it struck me that there may be another sort of more natural um, definition, in other words, a cross between a, a horse and a dolphin, when you think about it. So if, if a cardiologist is approaching a patient where the MDT consensus has genuinely produced a position of equipoise, no one treatment is better than the other. You know, do we have a sort of tunnel vision view of this and say, okay, we're just going to go down the route of PCI and just avoid any mention of coronary artery surgery, and similarly, the surgical approach might be similarly blinkered. Here, a rare photograph of the Manchester United footballer Rude van Nisselrooy. Um, those of you who remember him. Um, I'd, I'm going to take you back 30 years. I, I'm sure some of you will, this will resonate with many of you, perhaps not that many. So I cut my teeth at the London Chest Hospital, a fantastic institution. But in those days, there was a long waiting list for coronary artery surgery. We talk about 18-week waits nowadays. 18 months was the norm, if not more, two years often. So there were deaths while patients waited for coronary artery surgery. And our ability to recognize acute coronary syndromes then was also not as refined as it is today, I can tell you. Not necessarily at the London chest, but up and down the country. Patients would come in with chest pain and be uh, sent out on Gaviscon or something like that, and uh, goodness knows what would happen to them. And as we know, or some of you may remember, there was poor access to coronary angiography. So this was 30 years ago, and I can certainly remember those days. And then I think it's important to appreciate that there are certain fundamentals about coronary disease, and I put this up partly to be provocative. The disease is progressive, and of course we can modify that with medical therapy, and that's improved. I do believe that coronary artery surgery has a shelf life, pause, and <laughs> I also believe that you have one ticket for coronary artery surgery, and you are best using it at the right time. The procedural risk for angioplasty will always be less than for coronary artery surgery, and as I think it has been mentioned already this morning, it is the use of the left internal mammary onto the LAD that I think is the pivotal 
uh, weight. That's the robustness of coronary artery surgery. In other words, if you're having coronary artery bypass grafting that does not include dealing with the LAD, then I think there's got to be a good reason why you're having surgery. Provocative or what? You're familiar with this. It's uh, a couple of years out of date, but the story has not changed. I don't put this up to make you feel rotten. I really don't. Pause. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I show it to make a point that this idea that, oh, the interventional cardiologists are taking work away from surgeons and, and uh, such like is a, is a myth and always has been. You know, I, I appreciate this isn't a mathematical, mathematically correct extrapolation line, but if you extend what might have been surgical activity, you still have to then explain this discrepancy between what we've been doing and what surgery would have addressed. And of course, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to realize that we have uncovered a huge population of patients that were never investigated before, whose acute coronary syndromes were never recognized. And of course, there's the, also the emergence of a sizable proportion of work now done in the context of primary angioplasty. A third of our work is primary, which explains the bags under my eyes. <laughs> Two years ago, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> And the reason that we've been able to delve into the bottom nine-tenths of the iceberg that we only just touched the surface of before is largely, but not exclusively, down to this little fellow, which, of course, nowadays, if you go into hospital with any pain between your forehead and your toes, <laughs> they will check a troponin, and suddenly the patient's served up to cardiology. So troponin has been a great development for cardiology, but it comes with a, uh, a certain... Uh, price in terms of effort and sieving out what is and isn't cardiac. But the point being that we are dealing with a different population of patients than we used to deal with uh, 10, 20 years ago, and that's surgery as well as uh, intervention. I think this is an important um, issue to hopefully scotch. The idea that the patient is owned by the cardiologist until such time as he or she deems it reasonable to offer it to the surgeon. I think that's a, that's a perception that may well have had um, validity in the years gone by. I think nowadays, again, I, I've said earlier, I think there is a change and it is evolving and those days are certainly in our own institution long gone and I hope we'll see less of it. But it's, it's, it's patently inappropriate to hold the patient's investigations to yourself until you deem it appropriate then to discuss it with others. So here is the typical MDT. Who is that handsome chap in the corner? I don't know. <laughs> you can see Heyman there. But th this is a reality for us. This is twice a week, and it's a very enjoyable and uh, developmental process. And probably stems from the fact that our own unit started together, and so we have a joint vision. We've seen that before. I'll talk very briefly about syntax. Again, if you... Uh, go to the glossary de definition, I simply believe it's the use of the correct grammar when you speak to patients about revascularization. That's what I think its, it's uh, importance is. You know, ever since angioplasty and surgery were pitted against each other in randomized trials, and I go back to Cabri, and I go back to East and Barry, and SOS and Arts, and they're as familiar to you as they are to me, this is the same result. There is no difference in terms of death or myocardial infarction, and the penalty you pay for a strategy of intervention is simply an increased likelihood of re-intervention in the year or two subsequently. I take on board the analysis from syntax specifically around three-vessel disease and left main disease that we've heard, but I can reassure you that 75% of angioplasties done in this country are done in the context of single-vessel disease. So I don't think the problem is quite as, as uh, important or big as, as, as perhaps has been painted. And so this just reminds you that the driver for that endpoint, that composite endpoint, is reintervention across all the population of the syntax group. And you can dissect down and see where angioplasty and surgery are genuinely in equipoise, in the low syntax groups, uh, score groups, and they start to diverge as the extent of disease increases. 
you know, I, I, I don't think one has to be a rocket scientist to appreciate that. And as I indicated earlier, you can, and, and you can look at an angiogram as an experienced interventionist and say, well, that's a lot of work. If I was to do that, that would be four, five, six stents. You know, I think this patient is better treated surgically. And that, that you can see how the number of stents used does act as a surrogate, if you like, for the syntax score. And I think this goes on in day-to-day -day practice. Remember that if an MDT reaches a position of equipoise, that is not a point of impasse. That does not mean indecision. It does not mean argument. It means that there is an agreement that either modality is acceptable. It doesn't mean one versus the other. All parties have come to a consensus that either treatment would do, and that's very important, that important and that's what I understand by equipoise. So that position has been reached by full MDT discussion with all the relevant data, as we've heard, and the analysis of risks and benefits. There's a genuine consensus that either modality would be equally acceptable, and that position is then documented. So equipoise does not mean argument, it means agreement. I mentioned that um, we are in an era of transparency and uh, being overseen, and this is applying to us just as much as it has to our surgical colleagues in the years gone by. And this, I think, supports even more the idea of discussing these patients in an open forum and documenting that discussion in full. So in terms of a practical approach, one might meet with the patient, his family, in a clinic, explain the possible options, avoid, importantly, the perception that there's any clinical disagreement or indecision, because I don't think that's helpful for a patient to think that, hold on, if you don't know how best to treat me, you know, what am I going to feel like? I think the the emphasis is on the positive value of that, yes, you have a problem, and the good news is we have more than one way of treating you. And I think that should be seen as a positive thing. Of course, we all know that patients will, when you present them with what you feel is accurate data, trying to balance up this or that, they will often say, look, look whatever you think, doc, you know, whatever you think is best. Now, I can see that many of you are struggling to work out who this chap is. Anyone know? I think you all know. Yes, he knows. Pardon? Very good, yeah. Harry S. Truman, uh, President of the United States, ex, who famously, when asked um, why he wanted a one-handed economist, would say that because his advisors will also say, always say, well, on the one hand this, and on the other hand the other. You can see where I'm going with this. And it struck me that a patient does not want this sort of approach. You could do this, you could do that, you decide. Some patients do, there's no doubt about it, and patients come in all different sizes, but um, patients look to clinicians to guide them and to give them best advice, and we don't want to give the impression that we have no idea or we can't decide. So um, this is just a personal view. <laughs> you... <laughs> In the situation of genuine equipoise, and I emphasize that, where it's agreed by people like David and I and Heyman that really there's no real difference between angioplasty or surgery, you, in my view, got to be stark, raving balmy to want an operation. <laughs> you're looking at a low procedural risk. You're, you are looking, perhaps not sunning yourself the next day, but a rapid return to full recovery with angioplasty. Okay, there is the possibility of the need for further intervention, but, you know, I can, um, I can accept that. And, of course, the option of coronary artery surgery, if not avoided, then at least is delayed, and that's when you can use your one ticket for coronary artery surgery. Um, you will know how sort of innocuous angioplasty is. Here's an editorial some years ago by Bernie Meyer who likened uh, angioplasty to going to the dentist. Well, you know... It is a day case. It is um, fairly innocuous, leaving an undisturbed groin, or more commonly these days, wrist, as opposed to <laughs> constructing bypass conduits in this way with a slightly bigger opening. But, you know, that's all right. 
the two are different. And you, I, th I think if there is equipoise, a, a patient is likely to go for the least traumatic. As I said at the beginning, I've come from an era where we had to wait a long time for surgery or angiography. And, I, as, and Heyman will know this. I sit and watch uh, coronary angiograms with multivessel left main stem disease, and there's debate about we could do this, we could do that, I could stent this and rotablate that. I am sort of perhaps too long in the tooth, and I will not lose sleep if a patient with multivessel disease gets an operation. And I hope our surgeons wouldn't lose sleep if, after discussion, some of them got angioplasty. I think this is a very important test, the do you lose sleep about it test. One day I'll publish it. <laughs> so, in conclusion, this is not a turf war. And despite what may have been the perception of the years gone, and we should put the patient in the centre of our focus. Decision-making through an MDT is transparent. The consensus nature of that decision should be emphasised. We must avoid any perception the patient has that we don't know what we're doing. The discussion must be documented, and I think that is very important, because nowadays, documentation of discussion um, is vital. And who actually presents the position to the patient, I think it shouldn't matter, as long as they've only got one arm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes. Any questions?